said I wasn't going to do this video. I was just going to do the trilogy and be done. But a few months ago, when it released, I went to go see this movie. You've never faced anything like this. Let them come. And it sucked. I'm not going to get into why I did not like that movie in this video. But when it ended, me and the buddy I went to see it with were so upset that we needed to see a better Transformers movie. And while we both agreed that the movie we decided to watch was far from perfect, we knew that it at least had action that wasn't going to put us to sleep. And none of the Transformers movies have action that comes anywhere near the level of Transformers Age of Extinction. And upon rewatching Age of Extinction, I realized that that movie slaps on a level I did not remember. So even though I said I was done making Transformers videos after Dark of the Moon, much like Michael Bay himself, I had to come back and make a fourth one. Let's address that first. Michael Bay did not want to come back to do Age of Extinction. If you follow these movies closely enough, you can tell that with each passing film, he is trying harder and harder to get out. And there are actually a couple factors that brought him back to make a fourth movie. According to IMDb, he saw the line opening day for the Transformers ride at Universal, a ride that is based very heavily off the Bayverse stories and designs. And he saw the fans that were there for what he had done, and he was not quite ready to give up on the franchise when he saw that. The other reason, probably the more well-known reason as to why he did this movie, is that Paramount promised to fund Pain and Gain, the movie Michael Bay actually wanted to make. But in order to do that, he had to come back and do Age of Extinction. So he did. So the idea behind this movie is that Michael Bay would come in and set the franchise on a path going forward and then take a step back and let other people follow up on that. Although, considering he directed the movie after that, we know he didn't step back too much after Age of Extinction. Age of Extinction serves largely as a return to roots for the Transformers films. We see the Autobots go back to a more robots in disguise idea. They serve more as guardians. Even the battles and the scale itself is much smaller than, say, something like Dark of the Moon. They really went and harkened back to more what they did with the first film and Revenge of the Fallen. Now, as is customary among the Michael Bay Transformers films, the movie has to start with some sort of historical revisionism. And it was at this point in the franchise when they said, screw it, the Transformers have always been on Earth. And they reveal to us that the extinction of the dinosaurs was caused not by a meteorite crashing down to Earth, but by aliens coming to Earth 65 million years ago, detonating a bunch of bombs that released this sort of metal, and then they harvested that metal to create the Transformers. That's right, we are officially in the origin of the Transformers. And I dig this. I think this is a dope idea. I always liked the idea that the Transformers have been on Earth forever. I just wish that the sequel to this film executed that idea better than it did. But don't worry, you don't have to remember that lore-heavy prologue that much because it has nothing to do with Grimlock. You remember that dinosaur that they very heavily marketed the movie on? Yeah, the dinosaurs that turn to metal at the start of this movie have nothing to do with Grimlock. The Dinobots were merely designed after the dinosaurs. So none of the actual dinosaurs that show up in this movie before Grimlock have anything to do with Grimlock. Including, but not limited to, the fossilized metal T-Rex that we see in the Arctic in the very next scene. This is what I love this movie for, almost above all else. Is that at this point in time, because the Transformers have been here so long and they are so rooted in Earth's history now, people are starting to deduce and understand the science of these Transformers. And so we have people now going around the world setting up research bases and harvesting the metal. 
and trying to crack the code of the Cybertronians, which is exactly what humans would do if they were real. Let's meet our lead of this movie, Mark Wahlberg. That's not the character's name, he has an actual name, but he's playing Mark Wahlberg, complete with a Boston accent and everything. His character is from Texas, by the way. His character's name is Katie Yeager, and I know what you're thinking. That's not Sam Witwicky. Uh, yeah, that's because it's not. Shia LaBeouf was actually offered to come back for this film, but the reason he declined wasn't because of pay or creative differences or anything. It was because he felt that the character of Sam Witwicky had had a arc and reached his natural conclusion and there was nothing else he could do with that character. Which is completely fair and I love that he made that decision because he is absolutely right. So instead they introduced Kate Yeager. First hot take of the video, I like Kate Yeager in this movie. I want to clarify that. One of my big gripes with The Last Night is that Cade Yeager doesn't really have a reason to be there. But he fits right into this story and his presence helps the movie. He's a likable dude in this film. Sure, he's overprotective and a bit insane, but we're at the franchise where every character in these movies is absolutely psychotic. But he brings a certain needed charm to this otherwise very depressing film. Structurally, the introduction of Cade also orients the viewer into the world as it is now. Because last time we saw a movie in this franchise, this happened. The world is a lot different. It is now a post-apocalyptic world. Earth hates the Transformers because Earth got a taste of what a typical Tuesday of alien war looks like. And again, it looks like this. Cade drives by a billboard that says, remember Chicago, and there's a number to call in the event that you see alien activity, and we learn very quick that they now have a designated military to defeat Transformers. The Autobots are broken. The world is different. And not only do they build the world of the movie immediately, but everyone involved in the film did a fantastic job at establishing Cade's world in virtually no time at all. We immediately learn that Cade Yeager is both an inventor and a single widowed father who lives alone with his daughter and has a rule that neither of them should date. And we're at the first thing in this movie I strongly dislike. The first change. I would make to this movie is either get rid of that rule and just let Tessa date a guy, or B, eliminate Tessa's boyfriend altogether and just make it a father-daughter movie. I think that would work out great. The inside of the house looks cozy. Honestly, the entire property feels really nice. There's that robot guard dog that immediately gives you the sense that Cade really likes to invent stuff. And then you get to the barn and it's just this cluttered, dirty mess. Like it, it feels so lived in. This entire world feels so lived in, but so comfortable at the same time. Cade has stuff all over the place. It's littered with failed inventions. He's so greasy and sweaty. It all feels so tangible and so real. And that goes for the town as well. Cade drives into town to pick something up that we're gonna learn in a minute, and that town feels real. The theater feels real, and obviously they are real places, but there are realer places in movies that look a lot faker than the places in this movie. Enter our other main character of the film. So Cade's there to look at this place and see if there's anything he can work with, and while he's there, he finds a truck. And that truck has some faded flames on it. And it's also Optimus Prime's G1 mode. Uh, shout out that. That's awesome. Thanks for including that as a little Easter egg, Michael Bay. Glad you didn't stick with it for the whole movie, though. He's dusty and filthy. He's damaged. There are mortar and bullet shells inside him. He's in bad shape. And the audience immediately asks the question, what happened? To Optimus Prime. And we learn just moments later what it is that Optimus Prime is hiding from. 
the first shot of the attack on Ratchet might just be the single best shot Michael Bay ever produced from one of these movies. It's so dope. Lockdown sticks his head up from underwater. The water's running off it. You see a dragonfly fly away. Like there's just so many things happening. And the sound design, the sounds that Lockdown makes. He is the coldest robot in any of these movies. He also looks different from any Transformer we've seen, which greatly helps his intimidation factor. And did I mention that his face turns into a gun? And then we meet Titus Welliver. Always a treat to see him pop up. I love that he's in this movie. And he leads a black ops group known as Cemetery Wind, and their job is to hunt Transformers. And we learn within seconds of his introduction, that they are not just hunting the bad ones. They are hunting all of them. And they are brutal. Ratchet's one of the OG robots. He's been around since the first film. We all love Ratchet. And so what Michael Bay and Aaron Kruger did is they looked to the fans and they said, hey, would you like to see one of the staples of your childhood get butchered and executed right in front of your eyes? Butchered and executed is putting it lightly. They rip Ratchet to pieces and basically make him suffer. And obviously in the third film we all remember Dylan Gould who was working with the Decepticons, but we didn't see anything like this. We have not seen an entire trained military organization that is specialized in taking down robots work together with the villain of the movie. That's something new. This is like the Nest guys fighting the Decepticons, but worse because they're fighting the characters we love. Let's talk about Lockdown. One of, if not the best, villain in these movies. It's between him and Megatron because Megatron's obviously the GOAT, but Lockdown is built different and he's so badass. And to make him even cooler than he already looks and sounds, he's not a Decepticon. He is a bounty hunter that is open to killing and capturing whatever the hell he wants to kill and capture. He just goes across the universe taking trophies with no affiliation whatsoever. In fact, his first line introducing that idea to us is one of the best lines in the film. Autobots. Decepticons, like little children, always fighting. And that brings us to the second thing about this movie I would change. Have Lockdown kill a Decepticon. Emphasize that he doesn't take a side. If we see him kill a bad guy as well, it really hammers the point home just how brutal and nonchalant he is about killing. Because Lockdown going the entire movie just in search of Optimus Prime makes him feel like another Decepticon. I would say that Lockdown puts Ratchet out of his misery, but he really doesn't because instead of just killing him, he shoves what is essentially a, a, a giant banking tube into Ratchet's chest and rips his spark out, which is the equivalent of stuffing your hand into a human's chest and pulling their heart out. Very brutal, and Ratchet's alive for that entire autopsy. Now, this scene hurts to watch, let's be real. Ratchet's death hurts, but it's so necessary. And they could have killed any robot. They could have introduced a robot we've never met and killed that robot. And the scene would be fine, but it wouldn't be quite as effective because when you see a robot that you have watched and loved for seven years at this point get ripped to pieces like that and killed like he's nothing in the first few minutes of the movie, it ups the fear factor immediately and establishes the sheer amount of danger that Optimus Prime is in. Because that those are the guys that were after Optimus Prime. But then we immediately learn a very crucial piece of information about the hunt for the Transformers. How exactly you're hunting the enemy Decepticons? It's not known that every robot is a target. Attinger is the director of the CIA and he's working with Lockdown 
And as far as the world and the government knows, he's only targeting Decepticons. But he is targeting everyone. And the reason this is such a terrifying thought is because you know shit happens like that in real life. Oh yeah, Harold Attinger, played by Kelsey Grammer. One of the most memorable villains in these movies, even though he's human. Because he's really the only villain outside of arguably Sentinel Prime who has an understandable reason for why he's doing what he's doing. Because as he mentions, humanity has seen what Alien War looks like. And in case you forgot, it looks like this. Humans don't want to be dealing with that constantly. It's almost like humans aren't even in control of their own planet. It has just turned into a battleground for these massive 20 foot tall alien robots. And Attinger doesn't want to have to deal with that anymore, much like the rest of humanity doesn't want to have to deal with that anymore. So his desire to kill them all on one hand makes sense, but on the other hand, he's hunting my boy. So I don't like him. Speaking of my boy, Kill you. As sad as Ratchet's death is, I think the introduction to Optimus Prime is the single most heartbreaking scene in this film. Because every time we see Optimus in the other movies, he's whooping ass. I mean, in, in, in just the last movie, he tore through the entire Decepticon army like they were nothing. Yet in this movie, when we first see him, he's rusty and filthy. He's quite literally falling apart. Pieces are falling off him. He can barely stand up. His power systems are failing. He's struggling to grab his gun to protect himself. His ear falls off his head and he's leaking energon. He is in horrible shape. And then he's trying to find the Autobots to protect them, even though he can barely move. And the craziest and most heartbreaking part of that entire thing is that if this is the condition Optimus Prime is in, what does that mean for the other Autobots? And judging by what we saw with Ratchet's death, it's not looking good for the other Autobots. In fact, Optimus is lucky that he has all of his limbs. Also, apparently during Optimus's reactivation, you can hear him say, Sam, run, implying that the initial assault on Optimus resulted in Sam getting killed. But I always just thought he was groaning and growling, but everyone insists they can hear Sam run, so there you go. I couldn't find a natural spot to segue into this, so I'm just going to put it here. Beautiful bit of foreshadowing right here. It contains our life force and our memories. How we call it assault. This all culminates in the assault on the Jaeger's house in an attempt to kill Optimus Prime. Because T.J. Miller, who's in this movie, by the way, really wanted the money. Transformers Age of Extinction has, without question, the best action in the franchise. It's like Age of Extinction, 1, 2, and 3, Bumblebee, 5, and then if I go through the floor, and then down to my main floor, and I dig to the basement, Rise of the Beasts. And the setup for the fight is almost as good as the fight itself. It just has one problem. Scrap Shane coming to save them. How cool would it be if instead of a human coming to save them, another Autobot pulled up? It would have been amazing to see Bumblebee come to help Optimus. Whatever, I have a whole thing about Shane and I'll properly talk about him after the action sequence is over. So Cemetery Wind pulls up to the house and Kelsey Grammer freaks out over an Optimus Prime sighting because Optimus is the top dog. He's the one they want, but there's only one problem. When Cemetery Wind gets there, Optimus is nowhere to be found. Somehow he hid under the barn just in time. I always assumed that Cade told him to hide under there Although, I'm pretty sure Optimus just somehow got himself under there. How he dug that hole beats me. It's a movie about 30 foot tall transforming robots. I shouldn't question it. So, Savoy, that's the name of Titus Welliver's character, by the way, but I'll probably just keep calling him Titus Welliver because 
his actual name is an infinitely cooler name than James Savoy. He and Kelsey Grammer decide to take hostages until Cade talks. So they restrain Lucas, they pin Cade to the ground, and last but not least, they hold a gun to Tessa's head, knowing that at some point that will make Cade talk. Shout out to my favorite line delivery in the movie. <laughs> Shooter. But fortunately for them, Big Boy ain't letting that happen. And Cade fixed him up. So he's back in ass kicking mode. And ass kick he does. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention lockdowns here too. But because he's too badass to go in close, he waits at a distance and only fires his rockets when he has visual confirmation that Optimus Prime is there. And then the chase sequence happens. This movie really loves its chase sequences, by the way. There's gonna be a lot more of these. Optimus is on the move, being chased by lockdown, and then the humans are being chased by Cemetery Wind, because at this point you have witnesses. They can't talk, you gotta get rid of them. And Michael Bay really toyed with layers of action in this film, more so than he did with the other movies. He did this thing where there is action in the foreground, and at any time there's action in the foreground, there is constantly some sort of action in the background. And I don't just mean a general war in the back and the main fight in the front. I mean in any fight that's not specifically a one-on-one -on -one with only a robot present, there is a major action beat happening in the back as there is up front, and the camera work and the movement of the characters helps to seamlessly transition between those two action sequences so that you don't miss anything from either. For example, as the cars are chasing each other this way, Optimus will jump off the roof this way. So both pieces of action are happening in this direction, constantly moving at the same time. So you always know where Prime is relative to Cade and vice versa. So even though your eye can only focus on one thing in the shot at a time, you are always fully aware of what is happening in the entirety of both of these separate but connected fights. It's a genius way to film action, and I really wish more people would incorporate it instead of constantly cutting between two action scenes. And then the movie does something these movies have never done before. We see a human character that we have gotten to know get roasted. It, I mean that in the most literal sense. Lockdown fries him to a crisp with one of the, the coolest looking effects and shots in the film is just all of them running away. And Lucas gets killed. Now, legend has it that Michael Bay hated working with TJ Miller so much that he reworked the script to give him the most brutal death possible. The only way to make it more brutal would be to have a lockdown drive through his skeleton. Okay, it's time. We're at the scene. The scene that is somehow not the worst scene in the series, but definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, the creepiest. How old are you? 20. She's a 17 year old girl. They decided to write, shoot, edit, and release a scene in which Shane has to explain to Mark Wahlberg why he a main character in this movie is not a pedophile. What are we doing here? And while we're on the subject of Shane, let's just break down this character. Shane is the single least likable character in this franchise. And I'm aware of some of the characters that are in the next film. He spends the entire movie being a dick to his girlfriend's dad. And I don't just mean messing with him and annoying him. I mean being a complete and utter asshole to a man who has very valid reasons for being upset. And Shane never learns or grows at any point in the movie. He's the exact same guy at the end as he is at the start. The only difference is that now Mark Wahlberg likes him. And besides the fact that he is banging a minor, and he's Irish as they like to point out in this movie, what we know about him is that he drives really well. Now if I 
was the writer for this movie. And I had created a character who is an expert rally car driver to the point that he got a sponsorship with Red Bull, who, by the way, only sponsors the best drivers. And I know that the third act of this movie is going to involve a scene in which a character drives. Why the fuck does he not drive any of the Autobots? How cool would it be if there's a scene where Bumblebee or Drift or any of them realize that Shane can drive better than they can drive themselves and Shane and that Autobot work together to accomplish a task. That's what I would have him do if I was writing this movie. Unfortunately, I didn't. The easy fix, as I've said, is to just get rid of Shane from the movie entirely. Have it be a father-daughter thing of them getting closer and bonding because they're pretty distant at the start of this movie. And then just bring in Stanley Tucci in the back half to complete the trio. That's it. You don't need to add this unnecessary character to this already unnecessary runtime. Enough complaining, let's get back to the good shit. This is one of the top three best scenes in the franchise because the boys are back in town. The Autobots have been shattered up until this point. Optimus has been very injured, but he's fixed. He's not hiding anymore. So it starts with him calling the Autobots because like I said, we're not running anymore. We're getting the boys back together and Big Dick is back in town. For the first time in this franchise, we get to see what it looks like when a Transformer picks a vehicle mode. Their body quite literally grows, shrinks, expands, and shifts to account for their new shape, both in robot form and in vehicle form. And then we get to see the other Autobots in this film. We see three cars driving down the road, and then we get a giant John Goodman sounding robot shoot his gun up into the air to celebrate. And then a Ken Watanabe sounding robot who looks a lot like a samurai. I love this robot design so much. He changes into a helicopter. Now the reason Drift can change into both Bugatti and a helicopter is because he is what they call a triple changer. And that name is exactly what it sounds like. It's a robot who has two vehicle modes, typically a car, the flying vehicle, the two vehicles, and Bumblebee, the, the two Decepticons in that movie, were also triple changers. And Optimus pulls in, finishes showing off the rest of his vehicle mode in beautiful IMAX format. And that's a great time to talk about the other robots in this movie. So the Ken Watanabe robot is named Drift. Again, looks like a samurai, has two swords, never uses a gun. It's awesome. He changes into a Bugatti, some sort of helicopter. I don't know what kind of helicopter it is, but he's mainly a Bugatti in the movie. It's not that important that he turns into a helicopter. And the John Goodman bot is named Hound. And this is a good time to mention that the three supporting Autobots in this movie are all caricatures of a certain type of people. So Hound is a gun-toting, cigar-smoking, beer-belly Murica bot. Obviously the OG Autobot group is the best, but every Autobot in this movie just has so much personality. Every single one of them is so fun to watch. There's not one that I can comfortably say I like more than the other. And the last of the new additions is Crosshairs. Talk about character design. The dual guns, the waist cape, the goggles. The only issue I have, he doesn't really look much like a Corvette when he's a robot, but it's not that bad compared to the biggest offender that we're gonna talk about in like a few seconds. But Crosshairs is voiced by John DiMaggio. Great group of actors voicing the Autobots in this movie. And then we are reacquainted to one of everyone's favorite robots in this movie, Bumblebee, who did not die, he's not injured at all, he's okay, although I'm sure at one point he was very much injured, but thankfully they don't show us that. Could you imagine if Bumblebee was the one they killed at the start of this movie? Bumblebee in this film turns into what is undeniably the best vehicle he has in these films. He transforms into a 67 Camaro. Now I get that they couldn't keep him as that for the entire film because that would make product placement much more difficult, but I so wish he stayed that the entire movie. He looks sexy. 
And now I can talk about the biggest culprit of not looking anything like what you transform into. Optimus Prime. When he is a robot, he does not look at all like a Western Star 5700 XE semi-truck. He does look like a knight, though. And if you look at the concept art of this movie, that's the goal. They wanted to make Optimus look like a knight because they introduce the concept of Cybertronian knights into this movie, and Optimus is the last knight. At least until they make Cade Yeager the last knight in the next film. So on that account, Optimus looks great, but he does not look like the truck he changes into. I will say, though, looks a hell of a lot better than this. Actually, while we're on the subject of robots not looking like what they change into, there is no way on God's green earth that lockdown is that big. He transforms into a car that is just a hair over three feet tall, yet in this movie he's bigger than Bumblebee, who transforms into a vehicle that is bigger than the vehicle that Lockdown transforms into. Last thing before I get on with this movie, as much as I love the robots in this movie, I think the idea of the Autobots being hunted would have worked much better if the team consisted solely of Transformers we had met before. So, next change I would make to this movie, and it's surprisingly not that big of a change considering the robots they were replaced with are very similar in personality to the robots I'm putting in this movie. Get rid of Hound Drift and Crosshairs entirely and replace them with Leadfoot, Dino, and Sideswipe. I think that dynamic would work great. It's guys that we have seen before. It's guys we have seen work with Bumblebee before. And like I said, their personalities are already very similar to the Autobots they were replaced with. All right, enough complaining. Let's get into something cool. And by cool, I mean cold. Because after Optimus sees footage of both Leadfoot and Ratchet getting killed, he declares the following. I have sworn to never kill humans, but when I find out who's behind this, he's going to die. Foreshadowing! You guys want to know some crazy shit? We are an hour into this film, and they are just now introducing Stanley Tucci. And you want to know what's even crazier? So there is still an hour and 47 minutes left in this movie. Trust me, I had it pulled up in a separate tab while writing the script. This movie is so ungodly long, much like this video will be. And I recognize the irony in that. Can I simp for Stanley Tucci real quick? Because just one of the greatest actors of all time. He'll be in some really heartfelt role in one movie, and then he'll turn around and he'll play a narcissistic, egomaniacal tech billionaire who's building his own Transformers and is carrying around a tactical nuke with him, and then turns into a blithering idiot in the third act of the film. And if you think that's good, just wait until I get to unpack his character in The Last night. God, I'm sozzled. One last nip. KSI is such an interesting component of this film that I'm really glad is here. And I appreciate that the movie took the proper amount of time to set this up. They establish right out of the gate how difficult it would be to plan a KSI infiltration to the point that it really becomes an all hands on deck operation that leaves essentially zero room for error, which makes it funnier when they keep fucking up. This already allows for an exciting sequence in any movie, but remember, this one has robots, so it's even more exciting. Speaking of robots, lore time, as mentioned, the opening of this movie establishes the seed, and they reinforce, oh shit, an asteroid didn't kill the dinosaurs, this thing killed the dinosaurs. And Darcy, who is like Stanley Tucci's second in command, basically, has a team of people in the field mining for it and trying to get some. Meaning this mysterious metal is not just some science project, it is something with the potential to change the world, at least according to Stanley Tucci. And it's funny that for a movie so long it hates wasting time, because immediately after, we learn a bit about this metal. 
transformium, as they call it. It's up there with unobtainium in terms of names where science had a complete meltdown. It is a metal that has been on Earth for 65 million years, dating back to the dinosaurs, because again, we're really going far back with this one. And KSI has been harvesting it and breaking its code to figure out how they can control it. Yes, we are officially at the point where humanity is creating its own transformers. And we get probably the most out of pocket part in this movie because Joshua transforms it into some of the most on the nose product placement I've ever seen. Gets worse by the way. And then immediately pulls a gun on his coworkers. And speaking of product placement, this movie really does have some of the gnarliest and most on the nose product placement I have ever seen in any movie. Best one isn't coming up for a while, but I know you guys already know what that product placement is. But what is coming up is Galvatron, because it would not be a Transformers movie if Megatron was not up to something. And let's complain about Galvatron for a sec. I hate this design. I think the hole in his chest works. His body feels a little squished, and then it's like, we get to his head, and it's just, it's just so many problems when we get to his head. Like, his whole design all around, I don't know, he just looks like a troll. Now, the main problem area is up here. All of this going on up here is what's causing me the most physical discomfort. It's like a visceral reaction of discontent coming from this area. This area is not good either. I hate this, but I'm mainly worried about this. Damn it, I forgot Brains was still alive. In my Dark of the Moon video, I said that Brains and Wheelie died there. Except this movie changes that. And it makes sense, there's, there's a rule of storytelling, if you do not see a body, you cannot confirm that it happened. And we do not see Wheelie and Brains die. But the way his story ended in that movie was so perfect for that particular character that I just wish they kept him dead. Okay, the infiltration. Let's talk about it, it might take me a second or several to talk about it because I love every second of it from the moment they start devising the plan. Marky Mark gets a scan of a name badge and then Bumblebee forges it into Shane's face so that they can get in the doors of KSI. And then they explain the plan. And Michael Bay really likes having multiple things happening at a time and he uses this as a great way to just subtly and very briefly flesh out every Autobot some more. In the shot where he's giving the briefing and everyone's gathered around, take a look at each robot. They all have a different thing going on. So you have Drift who's projecting the map. Then you have Hound who is not looking at the briefing. He's admiring and cleaning his guns. And then you have Crosshairs who couldn't give less of a shit. He's just looking cool because he knows he's cool. Bumblebee is standing around listening but waiting for orders. He's ready to go. And then you have Prime who has taken a knee to get on the same level as everyone else. And he is honed in on every word Cade is saying. There is nothing in the world more important to Optimus in this moment than what Cade Yeager has to say. The next step is to get inside. I always wondered though why they didn't bring in one of the newer and flashier cars like Drift or especially Crosshairs. Let me rephrase. I know why they brought Bumblebee in. It's because the plot required him to meet Stinger. So that has to happen. Fun fact, the agent who lets them through the KSI gate is the same guy who hit Sam's car in Dark of the Moon. Do not hit my car to collector's item! On to the funniest scene in this entire film. Bumblebee drives into a room where there's a man-made robot called Stinger who looks a lot like Bumblebee. And that's because he's designed after Bumblebee. And if that premise wasn't already funny enough, the screens in the room are playing constant videos explaining how Stinger is an upgrade and how lame and obsolete Bumblebee is. And we have established 
from earlier in the movie that Bumblebee has some anger issues now. And that leads to him almost blowing the entire mission just so he can beat the shit out of a man-made robot that's not even turned on. The shit that Bumblebee says and does in this scene has me cackling every time I watch it. It is genius comedy. I'm calm. I'm calm. I'm not even touching it. <laughs> oh, oh hell no. <laughs> Every single one of those scenarios is already funny, so Michael Bay, being the genius he is, just blended them all together. The scene is important so that they can establish Bumblebee's hatred and his rivalry with Stinger in the third act, but it does go on a little long. However, I love every second of it, so I'm not complaining. So after all of that goes down and Shane and Bumblebee make it out just in the nick of time, they have to escalate the plot, because that's what Michael Bay does. So this happens. They smothered wretched. I'm gonna tear them apart. You now have five angry Autobots driving towards KSI. And to make it even worse, Optimus is pretty much confirmed that harming humans isn't out of the question. Even the KSI people that are directly working with Transformium think they're only killing Decepticons, nice little bit of world building there. And then Cade gets captured because he's snooping too hard. So the situation, the only way it could get worse is if people started dying. But before the Autobots can storm the facility, Bumblebee has to get a sick upgrade into his worst mode in the entire series. I don't hate it as much as some people, but there's just... I think there's just too much happening on him at one time. I also think they changed his head shape for the worse. Like the, the flaps aren't as prominent anymore. And he also just, he's shaped like the crystal skull instead of looking like a normal head. The mask, I mean, the mask is cool. I will say, I like the mask, but I don't know why they made him look like Stinger when his entire thing in the movie is that he hates the fact that Stinger is a knockoff, yet they just made him look like Stinger. Just weird all around. The best part of the design is the fact that his right hand is just a friggin' massive cannon, though. The storming of KSI is so good that I had to watch it uninterrupted while writing this video. It's probably one of my more favorite scenes in the entire series. I'm telling you, this might be one of the worst movies, but it has the best moments in the franchise. Just from the moment Bumblebee launches himself through the window up to Optimus walking away, it's perfect all around except for Oreo Bot. I don't like Oreo Bot. Get rid of Oreo Bot. But as fun as the actual attack is, the best part of this sequence is the conversation between Optimus Prime and Joshua Joyce. Because it's heartbreaking and you get to see their different points of view on the matter. And that at the end of the day, even though what KSI is doing is evil and breaks so many different moral and ethical codes, at the end of the day, he's right. No one's going to care. It's all about technological advancement. Don't you get it? We don't need you anymore. They couldn't care less about the creatures that are being killed to get there. Holy shit, does that sound familiar? And speaking of escalation, like I was earlier, the conflict escalates. We don't stop after the storming. They don't retreat and go be sad. KSI's obviously not going to let them get away with that. So Kelsey Grammer and Stanley Tucci send Galvatron and Stinger after the Autobots, although Stinger falls back almost immediately. And Galvatron's transformation... I had to talk about this, you guys knew that, but I'm going to upset some of you because I feel the same way about Galvatron's transformation that I felt nine years ago. It's dope. If every character transformed like this, sure, there'd be a problem, but they don't all transform like that. Only the bad guys do, and not even the main bad guy. The main bad guy still transforms like a normal Transformer. It's the fake Transformers that don't transform like Transformers. That's the point. 
it's different and I can get behind if you're not a fan of it, but me personally, I think it's awesome and it made this moment so much cooler than it ever could have been. Then this conflict escalates further because it's all about escalation. It's not cool thing, stop, cool thing, stop. It's cool thing, cool thing, cool thing, cool thing, cool thing, then stop. This escalates even further into Galvatron going rogue. He starts to do things on his own. He kills several civilians. He's just firing rockets on his own now foreshadowing what we're gonna learn here pretty soon about him. And he is in an unrelenting pursuit of Optimus Prime to the point that Optimus has to order a retreat. That's how serious this threat has become. And once it becomes clear that there's no outrunning the monster chasing them, Optimus does the only thing he can still think of to do. There's no declaration of a fight. There are no quips, there are no fighting words. Optimus transforms, he makes sure Tessa's okay, and then it's into a fight. By the way, that shot of the mask going on is my single favorite Optimus Prime moment ever. Not seen because that goes to either the Force battle or him cutting through all the Decepticons and killing Shockwave, but I just mean one single moment. That shot of him gives me a full body chill every time I watch it. This is my favorite 1v1 in the franchise for the simple fact that it is viewed almost entirely from a human perspective and that makes the Transformers seem so much bigger and so much more terrifying. Tessa cannot get to safety and she only has a car of cover because Optimus and Galvatron are throwing each other around and get dangerously close to crushing her. At any moment, either of these two robots could step on her and not realize it. That is scary. And to make it even scarier, Galvatron speaks. That's not supposed to happen. And he sounds a lot like Megatron. You know, I'm really starting to think that that's just Megatron reborn. In all seriousness, I do like they got Frank Welker do the voice. I'm pretty sure they asked Hugo Weaving to come back and he said no because he hated doing the first three. But it works for me that Reborn Megatron has a slightly different voice than original Megatron. But it's not like the audience has any time to realize the voice is slightly different because the one thing that could make this situation any worse presents itself almost immediately. The cinematography slaps in this scene. Let me explain to you the dopest shot of the film. On the ground, from the perspective of Marky Mark, looking up at lockdown, track Mark Wahlberg along the side of the car in cover to finally pan over and see lockdown's foot crush the asphalt beneath him. It's for reasons like this that I did not like Rise of the Beasts, where is the cool shit like that? And because Lockdown isn't already cool enough, I mean, he only pulled up with a friggin' spaceship, they give him one more chilling line of dialogue. The trouble with loyalty to a cause is that the cause will always betray you. God, the people who made these movies are geniuses. Spider-Man was a hero. I just... Couldn't see it. I will say, the infiltration and later exfiltration of Lockdown's ship goes on a bit too long, in my opinion. I think it's cool seeing the night ship that Lockdown commandeered and hearing about that, and we get a glimpse of Grimlock, and we learn that Lockdown really only wanted Prime to complete his collection of knights, something that the next film retcons immediately. Lockdown trading the seed for Prime because he's a man of his word, like that's all really neat. But the problem is, the sequence just keeps going. We don't need to see the Autobots argue about why they're there. We know why they're there. We don't need multiple instances of Shane being a coward. Like the scene could have easily started with them getting on the ship, a few establishing shots to establish 
a passage of time, both the size of the ship. I like Shane screaming and Cade getting mad just to further that dynamic. And then just go straight from there to Crosshairs launching the anchors and then keep in some of Tessa trying to escape and having a hard time with it. But just take out the scene when that alien wraps its tongue around her leg. As for the armory, the hell's going on here? None of the robots on this ship are the size of humans, yet these guns are human-sized. Like, it's not like the staff in The Last night where it shrinks and grows, depending on who holds it. The guns came this size. Who is wielding these weapons? And then there's the shootout, and, like, we don't need to see Shane get scared and surrender immediately. Like, either have him stay in cover, or do something. He's just dead weight the entire second act and most of the third act. Most of the scene's fine, but there's just some stuff in there that feels like it's only in there to bloat the runtime even more. And the worst part is that we barely see any of Optimus's rescue. We spend most of the time on the ship with the humans, and then we cut back to Hound, Drift, and Crosshairs basically already outside Optimus's cell. Lockdown has the ship on maximum security, and they got to the wing where Optimus is being held, the guy that Lockdown has killed God knows how many robots to get to, and they have no issues getting there. What's funny is that Cade, Shane, and Tessa, who to the robots are basically so tiny and insignificant they're hard to see, they are in constant danger on this ship. But yet the giant, colorful robots are not in constant danger on the ship. And I know we just had an action sequence, so we probably shouldn't have another one. But have them face some sort of opposition, like a tiny shootout, make it a stealth mission, something other than them just walking in. Especially when you think about how much noise they make. Hound yells. Hound fires his gun. You're dead. He's alive! Drift kills something and yells. Get it! I kill you! Kill you! Yeah, I hate those things. Crosshairs rips part of the ship out. Hello, mama. Optimus yells his exact location to the Autobots. We're coming! Optimus, sound off! In here, quick! Hang in, we're coming for you! And they never get caught. And don't even get me started on Bumblebee, who is noticeably absent from this entire scene, just so he can show up at the end with a quick last minute save. You're the best, Pete. You are the best. You damn right. And don't ever forget it. It's so weird. You have robots. Use them. I somewhat have similar feelings on the spaceship chase. I like that one more because at least the robots are doing something, but it's the same concept. We get the point. We can take some stuff out. Here's what you need to keep. Bumblebee pulling the boat into the path and Crosshairs blowing the bridge. Keep that. From there, you can cut straight to Crosshairs teaching Cade and Shane how to shoot and then jumping off the ship with that epic shot of him firing at all of Lockdown's forces. And we can keep in the bit where Shane and Kate are hyping each other to shoot. That's fun. I like stuff like that. Also, it's weird that Chicago's now fully rebuilt. So, to explain why rebuilding all of Chicago in five years is completely absurd. In April 2006, the Freedom Tower begun construction. In November of 2014, the Freedom Tower was opened. That is eight years for one building that was built in response to 9-11. Now in universe, Chicago was about a million times worse than that. But all of this leads into the single most egregious, obnoxious, and on the nose product placement that I have ever seen. It's so crazy, in fact, that I don't even have to mention what it is, and I could just go on talking about the movie. 
And you guys will immediately know what I'm referring to. Now the movie has a chance to finally slow down. We've been going pretty much non-stop since the KSI attack 35 minutes ago. So the movie now gets a chance to breathe. All the characters are back together. Galvatron and Lockdown are both out of the way for now. We can cool down. And Michael Bay and Aaron Kruger use this as a way to answer some questions that the audience might have. Most notably, the fuck is up with Galvatron? I sense the presence of Megatron. And the reason Brains is in this movie is just to answer this question because they needed a robot to be able to answer the question for the other robots. They had Megatron and Sentinel's heads and Brain was supposed to be downloading all this information for KSI to use, but Megatron's brain was not as dead as they thought. It was still very much active and he infected Galvatron's body after they built it so that he could take it over. And he basically played KSI so that they would build him both a body and an army. And so now Galvatron wants to get the seed, detonate it in a very populated city, harvest the metal, and then use it to rebuild the Decepticons and wipe out humanity. Not a bad plan. There's only one problem. Optimus Prime's still alive, so that's not going to work out very well for you, is it? I cannot tell you how much I adore the twist that even in death, Megatron is still plotting and then just used that to be reborn. It's so clever, and he's actually deceiving in this movie, which is great. And now the goal of the movie has changed. Up until now, the Autobots and the humans have just wanted answers. But now that they know about the Galvatron problem, the goal has changed to stopping Galvatron, even though Prime is hesitant because of everything that happened between Dark of the Moon and Age of Extinction. And you know what? I get it. I'm with them. Prime, can I come with you, though? And so we get some pretty human moments. Not just with humans, but with robots as well. Because a large part of this movie, and I'll touch on it more at the end of this video, a large part of this movie revolves around the humanization of the Autobots. So... First off, Shane and Cade have a chat in a train. Somehow I thought it'd always be enough to protect her, but I won't be. Beautiful, because the entire film, these two have hated each other. And this is Cade realizing that he's grateful his daughter has someone else who can be there for her because he won't always be. And he at least sees that they care for each other and he's now more accepting of their relationship. But I like that there's still a hint of resentment. And honestly, there should be. Uh, I like that, you know, Cade didn't take a full 180. Thanks for being here today, Lucky Charms. Well, thanks for not shaming me when you have a chance. Oh, I'll have more. And then there's the chat between Kate and Joshua, and I really like when two characters with opposing views just have a battle of wits, and that's exactly what this is. It initially starts off with them threatening each other, and then quickly turns into Cade trying to get into Joshua's head to get him to realize that Galvatron is a Decepticon, and that all his inventions are turning against him. Deep down, I know you know. Your prototype's been controlling you. And it works because Joshua is then hesitant to detonate the seed knowing of what the consequences should be, which is why he's on the run in the third act of the film. That and the fact that Galvatron's after it. So, all around not good for Stanley Tucci. Another great thing is the bond between Cade and the Autobots at this point. They're working together. They are planning together. And sure, Sam and the crew did this in the trilogy, but there's a different dynamic with Cade because the relationship between Sam and the Autobots was a much more familial parental guardian type thing, whereas the Autobots look at Cade as a soldier. They view him as an equal and there's such an inherent respect that comes with that. When Cade speaks, the Autobots listen. He can command them to do stuff. Optimus takes a knee to get down on Cade's level and show him respect. How have I gone this long without mentioning the music? Because Steve Jablonski is back in the booth and he delivered one of the best scores action movies have ever seen. Dark of the Moon, that's the GOAT. But I put Age of Extinction under it. There's some great tracks on this one. Dinobot Charge and Honor to the End are some of my favorites in the whole series. But the standout here is Battle Cry by Imagine Dragons. 
Linkin Park did not return to do a song for this movie like they did with the first three. Instead, Michael Bay got Imagine Dragons to do a song for this one. And the song the band wrote is called Battle Cry. And it's so good, although I would advise that you do not listen to it on the highway. You will speed. The song plays at a few points throughout the film, and Steve Jablonski actually blended parts of Battle Cry into the score for the movie, which is really cool also. And funny enough, those moments where Battle Cry plays are some of the most emotionally resonant moments in this movie. I don't know where I would rank the song in terms of the other original songs created for this franchise because all three of the Linkin Park songs are bangers and defined my childhood, but Battle Cry is really good and it fits the vibe of Age of Extinction so well. They always pick the best times to put it in the movie. But then Galvatron wakes up in one of my least favorite moments of the film. He gains his sentience, he brings all the KSI bots to life, and now he has his own little Decepticon army for the third act. And I know what you're thinking. John, why do you hate this scene? Well, it's because of this line. Because it's so obviously trying to be a callback to the same moment in the first film but it completely misses the point of why it worked in the first film. The reason it worked is because Megatron went the entire movie listening to people calling him MBE-1. So that was his declaration of who he truly is. That moment doesn't work if you have him go by the name that they gave him. Just have him say, I am Megatron. I know the reason they stuck with calling him Galvatron is because that's what he is in G1 when he comes back to life. Just use it as an Easter egg and have him go by Megatron in the third act of this movie. But enough complaining, it's time for the most emotionally resonant scene in this movie and one of the biggest reasons why I had to make a video on this one. Optimus Prime's arc in this movie is beautiful. People just have yet to realize it because they're too busy poking holes in every single second of it. Optimus Prime has been backstabbed and betrayed by the people he spent years fighting for. He has now seen his friends and family get killed, he himself almost got killed, and he was on the run fighting for his life. He is now open to killing humans because he's that mad at them as a species. Finally, a human comes into his life that makes his life worth living and inspires him to get back up and keep fighting. He fixes him up, he helps him, he's even willing to join him on the adventure. But through this alliance, Optimus is able to see that humanity is committing far worse atrocities as a result of the Autobots being on Earth, and that completely breaks the faith that he was working so hard to restore in people. So he declares that they'll get the seed, but that's it. They're done after that. And that's a completely acceptable response, considering everything Optimus and the Autobots have been through. Because why would you want to keep helping the people who thank you by trying to kill you? But this all changes in a conversation with Cade Yeager in what is the single most well-written moment in the franchise, in my opinion, to the point that if you want to find a flaw in this scene, you need to nitpick harder than anyone has ever nitpicked in the history of nitpicking. Optimus is very angry and holds his stance on not helping humans anymore. But Cade comes in and mentions that making mistakes is part of what makes humans human. We make mistakes. And sometimes out of those mistakes come the most amazing things. And then it cuts to a shot of Tessa and Shane because remember, Tessa was an accident. But she was the greatest thing that ever happened to Cade. And then Cade openly admits immediately another mistake that he made. When I fixed you, it was for a reward. That was it. That was why. Cade only fixed Optimus 
so that he could apply that technology to his inventions and then make a bunch of money off that and then sell Optimus for a reward. Wait a minute. Sounds a lot like KSI, doesn't it? But the only reason Optimus is still alive to save his other Autobots is because Cade did that. And you can see the exact moment that Prime has a change of heart. It's not at the moment you think, which is Cade's last line. It's actually when Cade is talking about making mistakes. You can see eyes darting around and the way he moves, you can just tell that Cade's words are really affecting him to his core. You can feel the emotion from this CGI creature Partly because of the way that Michael Bay had these robots be designed, they have so many moving parts so they can do so many different movements and convey so many emotions. And then Cade drops the best line in the Bayverse. You gotta have faith, Prime. You know who we can be. And Prime is so touched by that. From this moment until the end of the movie, he is completely okay with helping humans. His faith in them has been restored because of this man that he met like two days ago. And just look at Optimus for a second. Look at all the detail. He has so many tiny little scratches and wear and tear on him from fighting and the way the light bounces and reflects off him, the sounds he makes just by moving a little bit. He looks tangible. He looks like something you could reach out and touch. As opposed to this fucking thing. I am sorry, Noah. Speaking of, Optimus Prime's arc in this movie is so beautifully well written that Rise of the Beasts copied it beat for beat and yet gets all the credit with having a great Optimus arc instead of the movie they stole it from. Another thing, not even about Optimus, but just about the movie in general, this film is much smaller than the one that came before, and I think it was a good idea to go smaller instead of trying to build again, showing that they can do an epic thing like that, and then they can come back and do a more character-driven, heartfelt story. It has a much less convoluted story than Dark of the Moon. It focuses on just a handful of robots and tells a much more grounded story with them. And by the time we get to the third act, it's more comparable to either the first film or Revenge of the Fallen as opposed to Dark of the Moon and what The Last Knight ends up doing. It's a good way of showing that you don't have to build and build every time. As long as you have a reason for it, you can do a smaller story that can work just fine. All right, we finally made it to China, only this far into the video. And I'm gonna start out by pointing out something that is gonna be controversial, but I think Age of Extinction might just have my favorite final battle in this entire franchise, because as opposed to the final battles in the trilogy that were very human focused, and the final battles in the reboot timeline that take place in an area where there are no humans resulting in literally zero sense of danger whatsoever, Age of Extinction's final battle focuses mainly on the robots and takes place in a densely populated city where there is constant danger for every single character. And because it's such a tight space, that makes it harder for the Autobots to operate within it, which makes it that much more intense. It's so gripping. I love it. There is no way that someone can dislike the third act of Transformers Age of Extinction. Let's talk about Stanley Tucci because what an amazing direction to take his character. For the first bit of the movie he was in, he was this super serious and genius tech billionaire who had the balls to look Optimus Prime in the eye and tell him no. And then upon the realization that a reborn Megatron has effectively taken over his company and now wants the tactical nuke that Stanley Tucci has no clue he's holding, he turns into essentially this idiot who's just along for the ride, has no clue what is going on, he's annoying Cade, he's going crazy, he's having mental breakdowns, and he's simping for his hot Chinese bodyguard who basically comes out of nowhere and just starts opening up a can of whoop-ass on the CIA assassins. Because, oh yeah, there are three different factions after the seed in this final battle. There's Cade and the Autobots, who are after it to keep it away 
from Galvatron and prevent from being detonated. Then there is Galvatron, who wants to detonate it, rebuild an army, and destroy the world. And then there's Kelsey Grammer, who wants it for business reasons and for national security. And you know what? It makes perfect sense. And I love that Joshua gets to join the Autobot team at the end of this movie because he's my favorite human character in this film. Like, Cade's obviously the best, but Joshua just cracks me up, so I'm glad that he's along for the ride. Well, it is only fair considering he's the reason this is happening in the first place, so... Makes sense. And, and just the mental breakdowns that this man has during the third act are... Next level hilarious. Is now being chased by CIA assassins. Hurry, hurry, come. Okay, come. yes, I'll follow you anywhere. You're amazing. It's gonna blow up. I, I don't know. The thing is beeping now, so you must have hit something. Is it gonna blow up? I don't know. But to really get into just the meat and potatoes of this fight, as is customary among the Michael Bay Transformers movies, we need to get Optimus out of the fight so that he can show up later and turn the tide of war. Unfortunately, no film after Revenge of the Fallen quite figured out how to do this in a natural and compelling way. So here is how Optimus Prime gets taken out of the fight in this movie. The Autobots ship pulls up to rescue Stanley Tucci, and out of the ship comes Hound, who's holding Bumblebee, who's holding Tessa, who's holding Shane, who's holding Cade, who's reaching down to get the seed from Joshua. One of the KSI bots transforms, shoots at the ship, which knocks Hound and Matt Chain out of the ship, and then the ship gets knocked off its course. Now, I'm assuming someone's on the helm of this thing, but they screw up. So they try to regain control of the ship, but it lands on the side of a hill, surfs up that hill, flies up over the top of it, goes airborne again. There's pieces breaking off it this entire time, by the way. Goes airborne again, does circles throughout the entire valley, goes in between, perfectly in between two mountains, so basically a canyon, and it's a very narrow gap it has to fit through. Manages to get through that and then fly all the way into this little bowl before it lands. That... Holy shit! Now let's set the stage for this battle. We have two Autobots, Hound and Bumblebee, and we have the humans but Titus Welliver and Kelsey Grammer are hunting them down because if they survive, they'll talk, and that can't happen. Stanley Tucci then says that Galvatron gained control of all 50 of the prototypes, meaning that including Galvatron, there are 51 targets to deal with. And because the humans aren't doing much besides the cover fire from Cade's gun, it means that we're locked in a 2v51. It's always nice to know what kind of numbers your enemy has. And so Bumblebee and Hound are the only two things preventing Galvatron from destroying Earth. It's pretty high stakes here. But of course, we don't get to see much of the start of that robot fight because we have to have an encounter with Lex Luthor. But not before. We get a line delivery so good that it should have gotten Stanley Tucci an Oscar nomination. Shit, oh my god! How do you say get the fuck out of the way in Chinese? I don't like this fight. I've never liked this fight. It's so dumb. Cade is an inventor from Texas who has not built anything that works. James Savoy is a black ops agent so good at his job that not only does he fight on the team of people, that gets to go kill robots. He leads the team of people that gets to go kill robots. So guess which one wins the fight? Well, let's hope you didn't put too much money on the Black Ops agent because Cade Yeager is gonna win and it's not even close. And honestly, the way he defeats him is just, it's beyond words. If you told me two hours ago that Cade throwing a football to TJ Miller in an old theater was going to be foreshadowing for the way Cade defeats Titus Welliver, I would have thought you were full of shit. Lucky for us, though, the movie doesn't stay bad for too long because it's about to hit levels of badass that aren't really going to go away until the film is over. 
Because the Autobots need reinforcements. And luckily for us, the same part of the ship that detached is the trophy room, which is where all the reinforcements are. Really weird that Lockdown did not have any sort of security in that part of the ship. So that means Prime can go get the Autobots. But not before he himself gets an upgrade. And oh my holy shit is that a rival to Earth. Everything about this is cool. Optimus revealing that he's not just a Prime, he's a goddamn Cybertronian knight. So he's even cooler than he already was. Wreck of your eyes, one of your knights. His arms turning into gauntlets as he pulls a King Arthur and rips the sword out. And then the fact that he speaks Cybertronian, it's the first time in the series, from what I can recall, that anyone has spoken Cybertronian since the original film. They intercut Optimus's Dinobot side quest with the fight in China, and I really appreciate that this fight is chaotic from the get-go. The Autobots don't lose control, they never had control. They're in a 2v51. They're not gonna win. The start of the fight honestly feels like a full-scale war as you're on the ground with the humans looking up at the Autobots towering over them and they're shouting commands and orders and Hound and Bumblebee are trying to coordinate their strikes and there's dirt and debris flying around, people are screaming, it is truly a war zone. And there are a lot of long takes to better show this chaos, and I'm so glad that Michael Bay went with that style to show the action in this fight instead of a bunch of quick cuts. Like when people say they can't follow the action in this movie, uh, yes you can. Very clearly in fact. I'd say you can actually follow the action of this movie better than you can follow it in any of the other movies that you can already pretty much follow it pretty well in, except for maybe the last night because that movie was chopped up, but dumb argument. I, I want to stop seeing that argument. It's also a great display of scale because the humans are stuck right in the middle of it on the ground the entire time. It's like I said, you just feel like you're looking up at these massive robots that barely even fit into frame. This is my favorite shot to show off the scale of robots right here. And remember when I mentioned that Michael Bay played around a lot with layered action in this movie? That's so clear in the final battle. Hound is in the foreground for pretty much the entire fight, but B is constantly making his way into the background in the middle of something else. The action's just happening, we're just catching B at certain points. And then on top of that, you have the humans either running to cover or in some cases firing back. And all of this is going down at one time in the same shot to show the chaos and the war that's ensuing. It makes the action feel a lot more three-dimensional. Stuff is happening everywhere, not just where the filmmakers want us to look. The way everything moves as well is so breathtaking. So I'm gonna play a shot for you. And I'm not gonna talk over it, I just want you to watch the shot. Cover fire. Ah! All right, now let's look at this more meticulously and just see how well everything is constructed and comes together within this one seven second shot. The humans run to cover. Bumblebee's in the background telling him to stay back because there's chaos all around him. He's clearly the bodyguard at the moment because Hound, who was previously cover fire, got caught up with a different group. The camera then pans over to Hound, signaling B to provide cover fire at 12 o'clock, meaning dead ahead of Hound. We then pan back to Bumblebee who shifts positions and hops out of cover briefly to fire at where Hound signaled him to fire. B, then noticing more hostiles behind him, switches to a different weapon and fires his wrist rockets. The camera pans over to where B fired to see Hound now off fighting a different group that's causing immediate problems. Then the missiles land. B was providing more cover for Hound, but doing so in a way where he can get back to focusing on his own fight and we can catch Hound in the middle of firing his gun. Why would he wait for the camera to catch him? He's in a war, he's fighting. The viewer is not gonna see everything. It's a seven second shot and so much happens in that one seven second shot, 
but you can keep up with all of it and the way the camera moves all works to tell the story. It really does feel like characters who are actually there on set as opposed to CGI creations that were added in post. And notice how people are everywhere. Civilians are constantly in the way. Because it's a war. As opposed to whatever this is. Oh my god, it's time. We're at Grimlock. And right out of the gate, it's hilarious because Optimus pulls up, sword drawn, giving a speech to a dude ten times his size who has no clue what's happening, and drifting crosshairs were not in on this plan and want absolutely nothing to do with it. But Optimus is so committed to whatever he just got in his head that he's gonna go fulfill this task. I can safely say we have reached the part of this franchise where the Autobots are just insane. Second off, let's talk scale. The scale of Optimus Prime to Grimlock is roughly equal to that of a human to Optimus Prime. The Dinobots are humongous. They make Optimus look small. They're so big, in fact, that to get them in frame, the camera has to get super low down to the ground and essentially point straight up. That's another thing I love about Michael Bay's movies that they completely dropped in these new movies. The robots don't fit in frame. They're so big that there is not a camera on planet Earth that can comfortably sit them in frame. And I know that's a negative for a lot of people because they would like to see the Transformers, but in my opinion, it just makes them feel that much more imposing. I'm going to address the biggest criticism of this scene first, and that is that Optimus resorts straight to fighting with Grimlock, which first off, he doesn't. Grimlock throws the first hit. That's not even implied. We can vividly see Grimlock attempt to crush Optimus right out of the gate. Second, Grimlock does not work like the rest of the Transformers. He doesn't take orders that way. He commands his people, but he's an animal. He's, dare I say, a monster. The only way you could ever get Grimlock to obey you is to tame him and show that you are a better warrior. And that's the only way that Grimlock would ever work for you. So Optimus threatening to execute a defeated Grimlock is the only way for him to earn Grimlock's respect and be allowed to ride that thing into battle. You can also see that with the way the other Dinobots watch. They respect the 1v1 at any time they could get involved. It's not like Drift and Crosshairs where they were like, nope, not doing it. The Dinobots full on refuse to assist Grimlock because this is a trial for Grimlock just as it's a trial for Optimus Prime. I feel that I cannot move on to the next scene without addressing Grimlock's transformation. Besides his design, the only thing you have to get right about Grimlock is his transformation. And holy shit did they get it right. Now I'm gonna say it, this is the best Grimlock design we've ever had in the history of Transformers. In fact, I'll take that take one step further and say that it is second only to original trilogy Optimus Prime in terms of best Bayverse design. I mean, this is an ancient warrior. Grimlock is so ancient that he makes Optimus look like a baby, and his design reflects that, just like the age of the metal and the fact that it's rusted and there's some green bits, and he doesn't look as natural as the other Autobots when he transforms. Like, he's beautiful. Seeing Grimlock on screen is the, the best thing your eyes can ever look at. They should have named this shit Rise of the Beasts because that's a fucking beast. In fact, the Dinobots are more important to the story of this film than the beasts that Rise of the Beasts is named after. One of these days, I'm gonna have to make a video on that, right? I am actually looking forward to that less than the last night video. Well, the coolest part is that the Dinobots are 
hella old. Like, they're, like, somewhere in the ballpark of, like, 60 million years old. The other robots are a lot younger than that. And so what you're effectively seeing is several different generations of Transformer come together to defeat man-made Transformers who want to detonate the thing that led to the Transformers creation. And that is damn good storytelling. And I'm not saying it's Academy Award winning storytelling by any means, but it's good storytelling. And it's a true till all or one moment. You know who's a real one? Hound. Optimus is off taming a dinosaur. Bumblebee's off doing something. I don't know. Bumblebee's weird. He tends to teleport in this movie. But Hound is fighting an entire army entirely on his own. And he's switching out his guns for different guns and he seems to have limitless energy. And that brings me to one of the last major changes I would make with this film. Kill Hound off. This is something I always thought this movie should have done, and I think the narrative would work better for it. Make the KSI robots a legitimate threat. Because the problem with B and Hound tearing through so many of them is that when the Dinobots show up, it feels like they didn't need the Dinobots. All they needed was Optimus. But if you make them a full-on threat, and give Hound, like, the waste management bot or something as a main adversary in this fight and show him actively losing and taking damage and bleeding and pieces are falling off him and he's starting to go down but he keeps getting up to fight, holding the line just until Optimus Prime can get there, I think it would work really well. It would give you more stakes, it would kill a robot you love, which since we're trying to go back to the roots, the first movie did with Jazz, and also, I just think it would be all around a more badass thing. It would work too with how much Hound loves fighting. He's Ironhide, but somehow even crazier. He loves war. He loves his guns. Let him go down with the most important fight of his life. But that's just my two cents. Back to the movie. Speaking of Hound, I would love to show you guys the best edit in this movie. You're all gonna die. It says so much. Hound is losing the fight. He has been knocked over, blown up. He's on one of his last weapons, which is a tiny handgun, and the music is all somber and sad, and you feel like you are legitimately gonna lose him. And then a more badass version of the same track plays, appropriately called Dinobot Charge, as Optimus and Grimlock tear their way out, towards the place, and you get this sense that hope is starting to return. It's such good storytelling! People have been sleeping on this movie for nine years, including yours truly, and I deeply regret that. By the way, Hound, one of the best Autobots that's not named Optimus Prime, Bumblebee, or Sideswipe. I'm sorry, Ironhide, I love you. But Hound is like your alcoholic older brother who is somehow funnier and likes guns even more, and I find that more entertaining to watch. So I prefer Hound to Ironhide. And John Goodman delivered. Boy is Hound amazing and funny. He has some of the most memorable lines in the film. I will play a few. This is not all of them, some of my favorites. You're just too disturbing to live. Take that, bitch. I'm like a fat ballerina who takes scalps and slit throats. And who can forget the forever iconic? Got your fortune cooking? No. Come here, little punk. And then Hound runs completely out of ammo and he starts turning things into random melee weapons to keep fighting. And there's this beautiful moment where Tessa and Shane clutch each other's hands realizing this might be it. And then you realize Marky Mark is the only gun they have left. Hound is down, B's off somewhere getting his ass kicked by his evil twin, and then something magical happens. Optimus is here! Optimus Prime's a sign of hope. When he shows up, things are good. 
Earlier in the movie, during the Autobot reunite scene, Hound said the exact same line and Drift directly acknowledged that there's hope again. On the spaceship, once they heard Optimus's voice and knew he was alive, they got excited because he was back, he was still with them. And again, that happens here. Once Optimus shows up, it inspires everyone else to get up and keep fighting. And people say Baver's Prime isn't inspiring. The scales completely shift. The Dinobots tear through Galvatron's forces to the point that he has to order a retreat. That is the fear that Grimlock strikes into the hearts of his opponents. Stinger and B, what a fun fight. I initially wished that we got more of the two of them in the movie to really build up a rivalry, but now looking back at it, B kicking his knockoff's ass in round one is so perfect. And just what a creative fight in general, because it's not just them fighting, it's them fighting on top of a pterodactyl. Every action sequence in this movie has to have a second part to it. It's how they keep it entertaining and creative. And so while they could have all accounts just had Bumblebee and Stinger fighting each other, they decided that they would put it on top of Strafe's back because that's crazier than it would have been if they were just fighting. And then that just adds more conflict in there because Strafe is trying to get Stinger off, which makes Bumblebee's situation worse because that's knocking Bumblebee off. And then the only way to get Stinger off is for Strafe to hit the side of a building, which causes him to crash, which means Bumblebee has to get launched off. It's just so creative all around. And the fact that Stinger is the one who grabs on and Bumblebee's having a harder time is such a great idea. He truly is meant to be Bumblebee's equal. There's only one issue. Don't fuck with Bumblebee. Another example of obnoxious on the nose product placement. Not quite as bad as the previous one, but still not subtle at all. Peach juice. When I first saw it, I was like, that kind of looks gross, but sounds pretty good. But that's it. The fight ends there, if you guys noticed. The Autobots have won the fight. Galvatron's gone, Stinger's dead. Now they're just kind of chilling, trying to get the bomb out of the city. And I love that once again in a Transformers movie, we have a scene where the characters need to drive something to safety. And instead of one of the robots that can turn into a very fast car, they have to take some random car. We need to get the seed out of here as quickly as possible. Damn, this would be a lot easier if we just had a car that could go approximately 267 miles an hour. It's a shame we don't have any of those. On the subject of escalation, that conflict was already pretty bad. There's nothing that could make it worse, right? Wrong. Lockdown is back. And what's terrifying about Lockdown in this fight that I love so much is that he doesn't have any secondary goal of trying to destroy the planet or kill all of humanity. Remember, he hates Earth. He just wants to leave Earth alone and go piss off to somewhere else in the universe. But his bounty's gone and he wants his trophy back. And so his solution is to turn his ship into a giant magnet and just start sucking up the city until Prime ends up on his ship. And that is terrifyingly amazing. But you know what would have made it easier is if the humans were in a car that could go stupid fast. Again, a shame they don't have any of those lying around. I think the magnet would have been cool if they did something with it, but they don't really. The humans just outrun it, and I noticed on my most recent rewatch that the seed is attracted to the magnet, but the giant metal alien gun that Mark Wahlberg is carrying with him is not affected by the magnet. But the problem is it's resolved too easily. Like, they didn't do enough with it. Optimus gets sucked up, grabs onto a building, shoots it, and it explodes, and then everything just falls back to Earth. Now, here's how you could have made this a lot more exciting. You have the Dinobots who really don't do a single thing in this movie after the initial charge. 
They are being sucked up by the magnet. Imagine how cool it would have been if they got sucked into Lockdown's ship and ripped it apart from the inside, which caused it to crash, and that's what destroyed the magnet. Like, again, you have robots. Use them. Because after all this, all the Dinobots do for the rest of the movie is just block the bridge, but there's no opposition on that bridge because Galvatron's army is gone and Lockdown only cares about Prime. Like, give them something to do instead of just guard Stanley Tucci, who finally made it into a fast car, by the way. Don't just have your coolest characters in the movie stand there while everyone else goes and kills shit. But enough complaining. Climax time! We're completely skipping over the fact that Cade finally accepts Shane and kisses his daughter goodbye, because that's boring. Optimus is about to fight Lockdown. That's not boring. And Lockdown kicks this off with the single greatest entrance to a fight I've ever seen in my life. Like if, if I saw that shit, I would assume I've already lost. You cannot beat that. It's over. That's the coolest part of the entire fight. And it's worth noting that Lockdown is smaller than Prime. Not as small as he should be, but he's still a fair bit smaller than Prime. And he has Prime fighting for his life the entire fight. I wish I could play the entire fight, but Paramount would assassinate me. And I don't really want that to happen. So I'm just gonna play some highlights. I'm gonna play some of the sickest combos of the fight. Just so y'all get to watch it again, and I get to watch it again while editing, because it's a really good fight. The ones I always like are Lockdown's combo to Disarm Prime. And then Prime's Jab of the Shield. It's really hard to notice because Cade's the focus of that shot, but Optimus is in the back, again, layers, and he jumps with his shield and jabs Lockdown with it. It's really cool. Oh yeah, Kelsey Grammer's still alive. I don't even know if I've called him by his character's name once since the first time I mentioned him, and I'm gonna keep it that way. Anyway, Optimus keeps his promise. And you chose them. It's such a perfect death for his character. It's nothing spectacular. He just dies like common trash. Optimus comes in, shoots him, and gets on with his day. I think it's also the first time Optimus directly kills a human. I'm torn on if he kills the humans in the barn at the start because he shoots near them, but not them directly. Whereas he just straight up shoots Kelsey Grammer. Like there's a hole in his chest and everything. But this costs Optimus the fight. Lockdown ends up pinning him to the wall with his own sword through the chest. That's brutal. I love Lockdown. Fun fact, Prime and Cade are effectively told the same thing by their respective villain, just corresponding to their own species, in this scene, showing how much alike they are and how much they have grown off one another. Holy shit! That sounds like Optimus and Noah's arc in Rise of the Beasts! It's just us and them. And you chose them. You save the human instead of saving yourself. And right when Beast is about to take down Cade, Optimus comes in to shoot him and then gets taken down by Lockdown, at which point Cade comes in to shoot him. They're the same guy. And thus the real fight begins. And by fight, I mean beat down, because Lockdown gets his ass royally handed to him on a level that really only Sentinel Prime has seen before. And hold up. We gotta talk about the guy. You all know the guy. The guy has been a talking point of this movie since June 27th, 2014. I have no clue what's up with the guy. He's just there. He's not there in the previous shot. Then he shows up in a shot, and I, I have no clue what's up with it. I don't know if they had originally cut something, if they forgot to take him out. I don't know. No one has answered it. Paramount and Michael Bay have not said what's up with the guy. No one knows what's up with the guy. The only theory is that there was a cutscene involving some other people at that site. I have no answers. I just wanted you guys to know that I saw it before I praise every second of the rest of this movie. So Cade starts shooting at lockdown, but that's not going to do much. Cade and Optimus both signed their wills before they went into this fight. They went in knowing they were gonna die, which is why they were so gung-ho that no one come after them. But fortunately, 
The other members of their team learned a thing or two about not leaving your own behind because B, Shane, and Tessa pull up to help beat Lockdown's ass. And once again, since they're the same guy, Cade and Optimus have very similar reactions to this. She never listens. Never. I gave you an order. I have studied every frame of this fight because it's great. B, shooting Lockdown in the chest is where the fight turns. It's not with the tow truck, like you might think. B gets a shot in on Lockdown's chest and that's what knocks him over. And from there, he has trouble getting back up. So we gotta talk about the fact that he gets defeated by an Autobot scout and three humans. Because first off, he does not. He is still winning at the end of the fight when Optimus is free. But second, the reason he's struggling is because he's so overwhelmed with by just how much is happening. Prime on his own. He can deal with. The issue is that he was not ready for Bumblebee jumping around at mock speed, Cade providing cover fire, and a tow truck going around actively trying to trip him. There's so much for him to focus on that he cannot focus on any of it. And that's what leads to his defeat. After what Lockdown did to both humans and the Autobots in this movie, it's nice to see that the final fight to defeat him is a joint effort by both species. And holy shit, I could go on for days over the fact that what freed Optimus and allowed him to kill Lockdown was not an Autobot tactic, but a human tactic. And that he is saved by the very species that he has hated and has hunted him the entire movie. And that tactic is coordinated by Shane, the guy who has been a coward afraid of any sort of danger the entire film. It almost justifies his role in the movie, and it is such good goddamn storytelling. Nothing will ever top Megatron's death in Dark of the Moon. That was just so perfect and came so out of left field and was so exciting. The lockdowns is pretty close. That is how you kill someone who has executed who knows how many of your friends. However, I will always find it funny that Optimus stabs Lockdown through the back, cuts him in half, and just throws him to the side like a piece of dog shit, but then has the audacity to say this. Honor to the end. And with that, we get to the last thing in this film that I take issue with. The way they get out of there. So they are surrounded by the last of the KSI bots, and you think, oh crap, they're cornered, they're gonna have to fight their way out. What's gonna happen? Are the rest of the Autobots gonna come in? Are the Dinobots gonna come in? Bumblebee teleports again, by the way, he just gets out of there. No. Optimus can fucking fly now. Oh, they fly now! They fly now? They fly now! And has, I guess, just been able to fly most of this movie and has not implemented that at all. You know when flying would have been helpful? When the spaceship got knocked away. You know when flying would have been helpful? When he was fighting lockdown. You know when flying would have been helpful? When he was on the goddamn run from Galvatron and when he was escaping lockdown. But no, he, he never uses it. And I read that it's an upgrade he got when he was knighted, but the movie did not establish that in any way, so I have nothing to go off of with that theory. But yeah, it's like just, again, the Dinobots have not done anything since the charge. Have Grimlock come in and save Prime. That'd be awesome. Like, again, you have robots. Use them. But I'm speaking of robots. Galvatron lived so that we can have Megatron do absolutely nothing in the next movie. And again, just look at the detail on Optimus. Look how beat up and filthy every part of him is. Having now rewatched the film with a different lens for this video, I can comfortably say that Age of Extinction has the best ending of any of the Transformers films. I always say it's hard to top the first one because of pure nostalgia and how iconic it is, but the emotional weight of Age of Extinction's ending hits so hard if you're not trying to nitpick the movie and you're paying attention to what they're doing with their characters. 
right out of the gate, Tessa hugs her dad. And the entire movie, Tessa and Cade haven't been exactly vibing together. They've been kind of distant, and Tessa's only ever cared about Shane, praising him for what Cade did. And that hurts him a lot, because it's his daughter. It's the only family he's got left. He wants so badly to be her hero, but he's come to terms with the fact that that's just not gonna happen. Then this happens. Kind of nice being a hero for a change. You always were on my life. And then Kate accepts Shane, and I know I've said this entire video that I don't think Shane should be in this movie. He's just kind of dead weight the entire time. But it is still sweet to see Kate accept him and see his family grow right here at the end of the movie, from being someone who felt isolated to someone who has this giant family that consists not only of humans, but of alien robots. The only thing that takes me out of this is when Joshua says this about getting them a new house. I might be able to help you with that. Like, no, dude, you're going to jail. Forever. Then the Dinobots are freed, and you get this impression throughout the movie that the Dinobots have been in captivity for a long time. And then right as they were freed, Grimlock was bested in combat, so he was serving Optimus. So to see at the very end, Optimus give these ancient warriors their freedom and see the Dinobots run off to go on their own adventures now as free men instead of slaves to a bounty hunter is really bittersweet. And I love the unspoken connection that Prime and Grimlock have. Just the look and the fist pump they give each other when Optimus sets them free. These are two beings with honor. The respect they have for each other is unmatched, and they don't have to say a single word for that to be known. But then Optimus Prime starts speaking, and this hits me to my core. I think I've decided that the speech at the end of this movie is my favorite Optimus Prime speech of all time, because it's so emotionally resonant and it reflects his arc and the themes of the movie in such a brilliant way that none of his other speeches do, mainly because he doesn't have that big of an arc in the original trilogy. The speech opens with Optimus making the ultimate sacrifice and deciding that it's not safe for him to be on Earth, so he's better off taking the seed and leaving Earth. And while he has no clue what that means for his future, it means great things for everyone else's future. Unless you've seen the fifth movie, in which case it immediately goes to shit. So Kate asks the question we're all wondering at that moment. Will we ever see you again? Mark Wahlberg killed that line delivery, by the way. I'm not gonna lie, I think his performance is very good for what this movie needs, but his performance in the final scene is especially good. I mean, you can see his lip tremble when he asked that. This is one of his best friends. This is a man he found a connection with that is now leaving him. Like, just look at the sadness on Marky Mark's face. Optimus has had a hell of an arc in this movie, and I'm gonna really get into it in a minute, but a large portion of that involves humanizing him, down to the point that at the end of the movie, he doesn't really see the difference between human and Cybertronian any anymore. He just sees one. And so he delivers the most heartbreaking line of the film, both from that newfound humanity and the knowledge that this is a sacrifice. And it messes me up, I swear. And it's such a great payoff to just sort of this offhanded line of foreshadowing in the first scene he was in with Cade, and that's how their story ends. Whenever you look to the stars, think of one of them as my soul. And his last line to the Autobots is just more of that. The most important scene of the movie was that lesson that Optimus learned from Cade. And so Optimus echoes Cade's own words as his final message to his Autobots. Defend this family, Autobots, as they have you. You gotta have faith, Prime. In who we can be. Defend all they can be. Just as that was the final lesson Optimus needed to learn, it's the final lesson he imparts on his Autobots as well. By the way, the shot of Optimus flying off with all the humans silhouetted in the horizon is really good. This movie, at its core, is about the humanization of Optimus Prime. And I felt it was best to wait until I had fully wrapped up the story of this movie to touch on that, because you kind of need the full character arc to see that. 
I think making Optimus the main robot off the back of the trilogy was the way to go because we got a lot of Bumblebee and Bumblebee with Sam in the trilogy, but we never got quite as much for Optimus Prime. He was more of a supporting character in those movies, and this one puts him in the forefront and tells an Optimus-focused story. And that allows for so much growth from him at a level that we could not have gotten if he wasn't the main robot. Here's the thing. Kate Yeager and Optimus Prime are the exact same. They start the movie as two very lost people who are doing everything they can to survive so that they can help and guide those who are effectively their children. They help each other on this journey of redemption and purpose reluctantly at first until the end when they're basically brothers and they go back for each other even if that means dying in the process. But it's all right because they understand their legacy and they have someone to watch over those they care about. They are also both the respective trophy of someone. Optimus literally being the one Lockdown's hunting, and Cade in a sense because Savoy and Kelsey Grammer want him so bad that they're willing to ignore the obvious signs of human extinction to get him. And it's through the worst that the other species has to offer that they learn to be the best that their respective species has to offer. It even gets down to the nitty gritty of Optimus referring to his spark as a soul by the end of the movie. It's one of those things that touched him about Cade and humanity. He doesn't see himself distinctly as Cybertronian, he just sees himself as a being. And so by the end of the movie, you still have humans and Cybertronians, but they're not defined exclusively by that anymore. Optimus is just as human as the humans he saved, and Cade is just as Cybertronian as the non-man-made robots in this movie. It also helps that the ones they're fighting are truly fake, turning Optimus and Cade, the humans and the Autobots, into one to fight the one that's not. And for all of its faults, it is one thing that The Last Knight nailed. Cade's drive to help in that movie, and to help out the Autobots and the Dying Knights and be a haven for them, is because of what he learned from Optimus in this movie. I think it's the greatest arc that Optimus Prime has ever had, so much so that three movies later they ripped it off beat for beat and took all the credit for being an amazing arc. Optimus Prime in this movie is at the height of his storytelling capabilities as a character, and that is why I believe that Transformers Age of Extinction needed to be made. Because while the trilogy is a complete story and I can view it as such, you did not have the arc and the growth from Optimus Prime in that trilogy that you get in this movie, and that's something that you can tell going back was lacking that they needed to do. His speech at the end of the movie is not just a message to his friends, it's a message to his newfound family, and that's why I can say without a shadow of a doubt that his speech at the end of Age of Extinction is his best speech in history. Alright, get calmed down from that dissection, let's finish this movie off. There's like 17 seconds left. So he leaves Earth, imparts some wisdom on the characters and the audience, and his final message as he leaves Earth is to his creators, threatening them and setting up what should have been an amazing fifth installment. Leave planet Earth alone, because I'm coming for you. Messages to my creators, leave planet Earth alone. And that, my friends, is Transformers Age of Extinction. I knew I would have a lot to say about this movie, I did not know I would have that much to say about this movie. And I recognize the irony of regularly complaining in this video about how long the movie is, but then turning around and making this behemoth of a video. But as I always say, it's my channel, and I can do what I want. I'm glad I did this video. It let me see Age of Extinction in a different light than I've been viewing it for almost a decade, and it made me really appreciate it, to the point that as it stands right now, I don't know whether or not I like this or Revenge of the Fallen more. I like the romantic aspects of Revenge of the Fallen more, and they actually work in that movie, but also the overall arcs of the characters in Age of Extinction is far better than in Revenge of the Fallen. So I don't know, it's a toss-up. I think they could go either way for me. Yes, I am going to talk about The Last Night. Eventually, I can already see the comments telling me to do it. I will. I need time because I have to rewatch the movie and I really don't want to do that and I have to decide how I'm going to write that video. 
because it's gonna have to be written differently than I did one through four, because I have a lot of negatives. And so that won't lend itself as nicely to this format. So I'm gonna have to figure out how I wanna do that video, but it's coming. Just be patient, let me cook. But while you're waiting, please go check out all my other videos. I also have a Curse of the Black Pearl video up because I am working on the Pirates of the Caribbean stuff. I came back to Age of Extinction because it was on my mind. I rewatched some stuff, but I'm going to be diving straight back into Dead Man's Chest. So if you like this format of video, I have an hour-long Curse of the Black Pearl video formatted the exact same that you guys should definitely go check out. And of course, go rewatch all the other Transformers videos while you wait for the last night. I mean, you have several hours of content there. All right, I gotta go to sleep. It took me forever to do this video and I wanna go take a nap now. Bye guys.